Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Umpile and I curate content for Bogamasa Book Club. And yeah, today I actually want to do a quick book reading. Um, I was meant to do a live book reading on Instagram and my network wasn't that great. So I'll be bringing you a book reading from Fool's Gold short selected short stories by Mujaji. so yeah i'll also link up everything uh, that you need to know about ordering your own copy from Mujaji books um on the description below and yeah thank you so much for coming to my youtube channel to check this out and if this is your first time welcome please don't forget to subscribe like and comment and i appreciate all feedback and i appreciate you for joining me this book is a okay so let me just read from the back of the book firstly Mujaji books has a proud history of publishing short story collections by individual authors and in particular debut authors this collection fool's gold is a celebration of the authors and their stories several authors went on to win awards for the collections and the story by Lori Kubuizile was shortlisted for the Cannes Prize. All the stories here were previously published in an individual writer's collection or in either Stray or the Bed Book of Short Stories published by Majaji Books. Uh, and some of the authors, it goes on to mention some of the authors. I've actually read from a short story um, collection by Makasasana Kaba. She's also featured in here. Renelia Malaji, I've also read from Wame Malefe, whose story I'm actually going to be reading from, and Laurie Kubuizila, obviously, and Joanne Becker, Jane Bowling, and Colleen Higgs, who is the publisher at Mujaji Books. Okay, and it opens up with a foreword by the editor. This collection is edited by Arja Salafranca. And uh, I just want to read the last uh, sentence from her foreword, because I feel like it spoke to me. The story, the story is both photograph and love affair. And these varied pieces hold up a mirror to our lives and the places we live in. Um, Arja Salafranca was actually uh, talking about when she opened her foreword, she quoted, she used two quotes from um, short story authors, Laurie Moore, who I've actually shared um, her quote as part of my quotes, um, author's quotes on my Instagram. And the quote goes, a short story is a love affair, a novel is a marriage, a short story is a photograph, a novel is a film. And um, the next uh, quote that follows after that one is, short stories are tiny windows into other worlds and other minds and other dreams. They are journeys you can make to the far side of the universe and still be back in time for dinner. And that is by Neil Gaiman. And um, Arja Salafranca was just referring to the two quotes that you opened with. Um, and yeah, the story is both photograph and love affair. And these very pieces hold up a mirror to our lives and the places we live in. And I really do believe that um, our stories are literally our mirrors. I'm going to read the author's bio, short bio at the back, and then I will start with Botswana Rain. Wami Mulefe is a freelance writer from Botswana. Her writings are published in journals, anthologies, and online. Um, she has had two short story collections published, Go Tell the Sun, was first published by Mojaji Books in 2011 and I also read on her, um, her profile on when I googled her that she has a short story collection called Just Once that is used in junior secondary schools in Botswana and yeah I wonder if she's actually writing like new stories elsewhere or we should look forward to um, new work soon um i actually i'm getting distracted by my kids i'm so sorry guys please forgive me my kids are still up downstairs so yeah 
This is Botswana Rain by Wame Mulefe. It was my mother who rang to tell me. She called at that ungodly hour of the night when messages of birth and death were usually conveyed. I felt the vibration of my cell phone on the bedside table. Say too, she said when I said hello. I have sad, sad news for you. I knew then that it was serious. It was rare for my mother to call me by, my, by the name she used when I was a little girl. Rarer for her not to know the right words to say. Komoto is gone. What do you mean, Mama? She passed away. No, Mama. How? When? I whispered, pressed the cell phone to my ear, and waited for her to speak. I listened to her breathing heard my heart beating in my head. I regretted asking the cause of Komoto's death, but I needed to know, even though I myself despised the way Botswana people probed the cause of a person's death, the way a nurse felt your arm searching for the right vein from which to draw blood. She committed suicide. They found her body yesterday. The funeral will be on Saturday. And, say too, she left you a note. A note? Why did Komoto take her life and why did she leave me a note? Fear frothed in my stomach like cola when you drop a pebble in it. My husband, Tato, lay fast asleep beside me. He slept like our baby did, mouth slightly open, an arm cradling his head. What if Komoto's note exposed my secret? I stole out of bed, taking care not to wake him, wondering if I would ever sleep so soundly again. When I was a little girl, life was well ordered. Winters were cold and dry. Summers were hot and moist. The way my geography textbook said Botswana weather should be. When it rained, I raced outside and squelched the mud between my toes. I waved my fingers in the air, shouting, Rain, rain, make me grow, as I chased after corn crickets that appeared with the rainbow like marching soldiers. After the rain, I played football barefoot in the sand and didn't care that people mistook me for a boy. When the sun got too hot, I rested in the shade with my legs drawn up, El my elbows on my knees. Mama would creep up behind me and clap her hands like crackling lightning, saying, Situnya, sit properly. You are not a herd boy. I had straightened my legs and pressed my thighs together, trying to be more of a lady. Back then, Komozo was my best friend. I was 10 when her family moved into the house on our cul-de-sac. We liked lying on our backs together under the marula tree, holding hands, sucking on its yellow fruit. She was a dreamer, even then. I would tell her a silly story and laugh out loud. She'd say, Shh, Situnya, listen. The wind is whispering my future to me. Listen. It says one day I'm going to fly to a far away land where I'll be whatever I dream. When my boy hips filled out, my buttocks grew rounder and softer and the marula sized knobs on my, in my chest swelled. Mama said, boys are trouble, run from trouble. But she needn't have worried. Boys, they did not interest me. I was happiest when I was with Komoto and I did not want to, to share her. When all the girls in my class were whispering and giggling about boys, wondering who was going to ask who to the school leavers ball, I really didn't care. But all the same, I played the game. I did not want to be the odd one out. As I grew older, life tested me. Home, school, church, Everywhere, it seemed as if I was being cast into a mold. 
In school, I had to memorize what made dust different from dirt. I struggled to remember whether to sweep first, then polish, or polish first, then sweep. At home, Mama asked, what kind of a woman are you going to become? As I grew older, she graduated to, oh my Lord, what kind of a wife will she make? I tried hard to be an obedient daughter, a good woman. Every Sunday, I dressed up in my floral two-piece to attend the early morning church service. Whenever Father Simon warned, hell is hotter than fire and cast out the devil, I felt flames singeing my body. I twisted and turned in my seat. I taught Sunday school, sang in the church choir, and I feared the Lord. I so wanted to be God's child, and I had to go to heaven where everyone was family and everyone was happy. I tried hard to douse that thing in me that caused me to lie awake at night, longing to be with Fumoto, but I could not say no to her. When she held me close and pressed me to her, I promised that it would never happen again. My love for Komoto was like Botswana rain, unpredictable. I gave it sparingly. When she responded, I held my love back. Then she would cling to me like a clump of grass growing deep in the crack of a rock trying to suck what moisture it could. But now Komoto is dead. No, she had gone to that faraway land that I dreamed of in delicate pinks and pastel greens where the sun didn't shine so bright and so long that it dried people's hearts and made them hard as biltong. Yes, this thought consoled me. I, revisited, I relived the last time I visited her. She'd called me, saying she needed to talk. We met at her house. When she hugged me, I let my arms hang limply but by my side. She had seemed distant, and her words stayed with me after I left, like puddles after the rain, murky and brown, concealing rocks beneath the surface. Do you ever think of me? She wanted to know. Sometimes. Do you love him? But of course, he is my husband. Maybe you could still come and visit sometimes. I did not respond. Do you ever think of killing yourself? Her question had shocked me, but I said, never. Suicide is a mortal sin using my Sunday school teacher voice and my words stemmed her questions. She made me coffee, put in two sugars, no milk, the way I always made it. She watched me as I ate the cake she offered me, chocolate cake, my favorite. But soon the silence between us became unbearable. I left. So, Komoto and Situnya grew up together and they fell in love. And Situnya is living a life of secret, a secret life, because she can't come out. Although I did not want him to, Tato went with me to Komoto's funeral. He was my husband and he always did what was right. That was his way. We drove in silence from our home to hers. I stared out of the window worrying about what Komoto's note might reveal. Her home seemed further away than I remembered, but maybe it was because Tato drove slowly. Rain had gouged out the surface of the road, creating a patchwork of grit, tar, and potholes. As we approached her home, I saw a woman sitting alone in the shade of the Marula tree, where I used to sit with Komoto pretending to the world that we were just friends. Mm. 
So I'm going to stop there. The story doesn't um, stop there. But that was that would have been my live book reading on Instagram. And if you're not following me on Instagram and my socials, my link is in my bio. And I will actually link it up on the description below. And yeah, this was from Wame Molefe. And it's taken from this beautiful collection of short stories compiled by Mojaji and edited by Arja Salafranca. Um, Arja, Arja also has a story in this collection titled The Thin Line. And so she has that story and she has written the foreword to this as she is the editor. And I will also link up Mojaji's details on the description. I hope you enjoyed this reading. Oh my goodness, this story. Um, I think it's encouraged me to actually want to uh, continue reading more of Wame's work because I see that she has short stories um, on some online literary magazines. And if you have missed out on some of the work that I've been doing over the past year during lockdown, I have been reading from short stories and um, short story collections and online literary magazines. I've created a, um, a series on my Instagram TV titled uh, online literary magazines from so that's the Fridays we are actually read from online literary magazines like Duke Lit Mag. Um, so yeah, if you're not following me on Instagram, please do so. And maybe do follow some of the, the videos that I've posted previously on here on, on, on my YouTube channel because I have actually um, loaded some of the, cha of the videos on the platform just as an archival um, way of saving my work and all the reading so you can binge watch because um, some of the videos are very long. But yeah, okay, before the kids start making more noise because they're about to do their bath. Um, thank you so much, guys. This has been another reading of a beautiful African story. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy weekend. Bye. Till next time.